Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. I think you helped the stock too. September 20th. That's not true. Yeah, for that's the good. Whirling of I wind. have it right here. Did, did you see the stock price? I don't know if you followed it. It's way up today. Maybe you helped it with buying it. <laughs> I did. I bought it. It's, it's, uh, last the stock was up $44 today. That's a ready. lot. Yeah. That's because he's resigning. It wasn't that the play was to make the, the money. one way up. They made an agreement with the SEC and the guy over the you know, was, was giving up. Just match the tie you had on today. Yeah. 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 So it was I had good. a different one on. Very good for the company. I had a purple tie. Those probably changed the match. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He did buy one. It's out front. I've never sure. seen him. I mean, it's in the distance. Seems like he used to. Him. Like, but he's still oh, CEO. Yeah. Well, he's giving up full control though. That's not my understanding. My understanding is he's still chief executive officer. <laughs> Good evening. Okay. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Monday, October 1st town council meeting. This is our first meeting in workshop format, so we won't be making any um, motions, I think, other than to adjourn the meeting. Um, otherwise, we'll be working... Um, We'll be listening to presentations and having discussions um, and not voting on, on um, much. So anyway, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance by Councillor Rao, please. Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton? Here. Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hurley? Here. Councillor Latino? He's not here yet. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor Rao? Here. Councillor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And Mayor Morin Bello? Here. Thank you. Thank you. The first thing we have tonight <clears throat> is the Weathersfield Historical Society presentation. If you'd come on up, please. Good evening. I'm Amy Whitorf, 17 Center Street. I'm the Executive Director of Weathersfield Historical Society, and I am here with our board members, Doreen C. Arcia and Mike Monroe. Weathersfield Historical Society was founded as a private nonprofit by local residents in 1932. Today, over 86 years later, Weathersfield Historical Society continues to meet the objectives of its founders in our mission to preserve and promote Weathersfield's history and culture to inspire people today and tomorrow. As Weathersfield Historical Society is a community organization founded, funded, and governed by our community members, none of the services would be possible without the support of our members, both their financial support and their gifts of their time and talent. We're proud to partner with the town of Weathersfield to administer four of its historic buildings so that they may be preserved and available to the public. The society spends over 50% of its total budget annually to maintain these buildings and keep them open to the public free of charge. We'd like to also give special thanks to the Weathersfield Physical Services staff members who are very supportive of the society and a joy to work with. Weathersfield Historical Society presents over 70 public programs or special events annually, many of them offered free of charge. We served over 20,000 physical visitors at our sites in the past year. Another 50,000 used the resources on our website. Over 2,000 of those visitors to our sites were students for school tours. Most of those students are from Weathersfield Public Schools who visit free of charge thanks to our grant from the Robert Allen Keeney Memorial Fund. We're privileged to partner with many of our neighboring nonprofit organizations to present award-winning programming for our community. Our partners include Weathersfield Public Schools, the Great Meadows Conservation Trust, the Weathersfield Academy for the Arts, the Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, Time to Talk, People Empowering People, the Webb Dean Stevens Museum, the Friends of Cedar Hill Cemetery, Old Weathersfield Shopkeepers Association, the Village Cemetery Associ Association, the First Church of Christ, and many more. Later this month, we will present our ninth annual Old Weathersfield Lantern Light Tours, featuring three centuries of Weathersfield businessmen and women. 
We are proud to say that last year's tours, Forgotten Residents of Wethersfield, won an award of merit from the Connecticut League of Historical Organizations. This popular event would not be possible without the support of our community volunteers. It takes 50 people to research, create, and run our lantern light tours, and most of them are volunteers. Volunteers also assist with creating our temporary exhibits from the popular Kevin the Turkey exhibit with photos by George Savick to our festive Holidays of Wethersfield's World exhibit created by community members in conjunction with volunteers from our local chapter of People Empowering People with support from the Wethersfield Early Childhood Collaborative and funding from the Robert Allen Keeney Memorial Fund at the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. This is another of the most important services the society provides for the town the opportunity for our community to come together to learn and celebrate our town and our shared heritage, all periods of our town's history and all people who call it home. History happens every day and Wethersfield Historical <coughs> Society is here every day to celebrate and preserve it. I'd like to say thank you, Mayor Bellow and Councilor Rell, our town council liaison for your support during the year. Wethersfield Historical Society is proud to be partners with the town of Wethersfield in serving our vibrant community and preserving its heritage. We look forward to providing opportunities for community learning and fellowship for many years to come. And Mayor Bellow, if you would please accept the traditional one rope of red onions, which is our <laughs> rent for the Cove Warehouse. We had a casualty this year. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we make a quick photo op? Sure. Thank you. And before I read the proclamation, I'd like to say thank you um, for the craft fair this weekend. You got lucky. We had some great weather for that. It looked like there was a good turnout. I attended and lots of people, lots of vendors. That was a great event. And then at some point you'll have to um, let us know all that's going on with the filming down in Old Weathersfield and the Keeney's part in that. We'd love to hear about that at some point too. So thank you. Next we have a library proclamation. Speak into the microphone here. Okay, welcome. So whereas in March 1783, a group of Wethersfield citizens met formally to establish the town's first library in Wethersfield, which was called the Union Society Library. And whereas in 1798, the library was moved to the completed Academy Hall, and almost all the books in the collection were about religion and philosophy. And whereas in 1866, Mr. Chauncey Rose of Terre Haute, Indiana, formerly a Wethersfield resident, offered the recently formed Wethersfield Library Society $2,500 if the town would raise another 500 to cr create a library. And whereas this library was called the Rose Library and was housed in the second story of the building on the corner next south of the Congregational Church. And in 1872, it was moved to the upper room of the Congregational Chapel. Whereas in March 1887, the state of Connecticut, by a special act, granted it in as a public library. Whereas in 1896, the library moved from the Congregational Chapel to the Academy Building and then again moved in 1940 to the Wells School. And whereas in 1954, the Citizens Library Survey Committee was created by the Town Council and they recommended a site owned by the town on the corner of the Silestine Highway and Church Street that would also include a new town hall. And the new building was opened on October 7th, 1959. And whereas, people come to Wethersfield to utilize our resources. Our library contains over 100,000 items, including genealogies on many of the major Wethersfield families, local and regional histories, secondary source materials, newspapers, maps, and hundreds of photo uh, photographs of town events and people. Now, therefore, on behalf of the Town Council 
and our library patrons, I, Amy Morin Bello, Mayor of the Town of Wethersfield, do hereby congratulate the library as it celebrates 235 years of outstanding service to our community. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand and cause the seal of the Town of Wethersfield to be affixed this first day of October, 2018. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the proclamation. The suggestion to celebrate 235, uh, the 235th anniversary of libraries in Wethersfield came from Carolyn Valeres of the Friends of the Wethersfield Library. When we first heard this, we were surprised. And then we went, is that really true? And of course, we're librarians, so we had to fact check a bit. <laughs> and many thanks to Dolores for, uh, for uh, backing us up on what we discovered. Um, and it turns out that, yes, indeed, there's been a library in the town of Wethersfield for 235 years of some sort. Um, in addition to our regular fall programming coming up, we have geared events around the 235th celebration. We're having a few local authors. We're launching a thousand books before kindergarten program with Llama Llama on Saturday, October 13th at 10.30 in the morning. We're having a genealogy program and a writing workshop and a few other events this fall. Uh, we also will be having a special display um, and a timeline, um, and this is co-hosted with the Wethersfield Historical Society. So thank you to them for all of their great work on that. It is our hope that 2018 can be an opportunity to celebrate all libraries in the town of Wethersfield um, that have ever existed. Currently, we have a few free little libraries. Um, we have libraries in our schools. We have a library at the Historical Society and obviously our, our public library, which we believe is a, a town treasure. A celebration will take place at the library on Friday, October 26 at 5 p.m. And we hope that people will visit our website um, to purchase tickets. And we hope that the entire community will join us at this event. So thank you again to the mayor and town council with this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next section is public comment. Is there anybody from the public who would like to speak tonight? Come on up, Jim. I came to uh, thank everybody who earned an orange shirt Saturday morning at the uh, Weathersfield Cove, and that includes council members uh, Breton, uh, Lesser, and Hurley, as well as Mayor Morin. Thank you so much, and her daughter, who, uh, well, anyway, we'll. <laughs> and the hundred or so volunteers who earned their orange shirts. Uh, also, thanks to the Park and Rec and town crews who installed the dock extension because the water was high, uh, pruned the growth back to make the path around to, under the highway to the river more accessible, inviting. Um, the Wethersfield Police Department, who provided a boat with uh, Lieutenant Crabtree and others and, a, and two other officers to keep us safe. Um, and uh, <clears throat> also the Connecticut River Conservancy, who organizes this whole thing, source to the sea, or source to the sea, north to south of the entire uh, watershed. The MDC, who acts as host, provides food and, and uh, tools. Um, the Conti, Silvio Conti National Fish and Wildlife Service who provided two boats, including a really cool airboat. Um, <clears throat> and so the statistics, 2,100 beverage containers were collected. Sadly, that's maybe more than scratching the surface, but there's a lot still out there. We could have used a whole flotilla of, of kayaks because the water was up and a lot of stuff was floating. Um, seven tires. Every year. Two of them are pretty recent off the side of the highway for sure. Tr truck tires and car tires. 
um, <clears throat> 50 single-use plastic bags, two large styrofoam dock floats in a barrel, 500 feet of fishing line. We have a thing to stick fishing line in, but not all fishermen do it. Hundreds of potato chip bags. We didn't count those. Alicia Sherman of the um, Connecticut River Conservancy was counting. Um, so we can be proud that we have the largest cleanup in Connecticut, only the second largest on the entire watershed. Of course, we're not really that proud that we have one of the worst concentrations of trash on the river, in our river, but we work at it. And it was a grand day, beautiful day as the, the craft show that, uh, was, was wonderful. Um, it was also a grand day on the river, 600 um, boats from the riverfront recapture regatta rode down the, the uh, river and formed up and outside of our cove for their heats, their 35 meter heats upriver as the current was coming down. And uh, the earliest ones probably saw their orange shirted volunteers along the shore picking stuff up. Uh, so that was uh, a wonderful day and thank you so much and, and, uh, and all of us and all the volunteers. Now just to putting on a different hat, the Keisha Farm referendum, yes, on question three. I bought an awesome pumpkin this morning at the Keisha Farm stand. Ten bucks, stick it in the thing, honor system. Um, and on November 7th, we'll have the opportunity to approve the purchase of a hundred-year-old, the hundred-year-old Keisha Farm for $2.4 million. We can't afford not to buy it. How do I know that? Well, the key to understanding why that's true uh, is in these three documents here. Um, <clears throat> it's called Cost of Com Community Services, and uh, th this one's the national study with the hundreds of communities across the nation and how much from a residential property in taxes you receive and how much you give back in town services. And then there's the uh, six or eight or ten of them done in Connecticut, including Colchester 2013. Uh, this is the summary. This is the first two pages of the entire study. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for every dollar in taxes, the towns would spend $1.14 or $1.33. Those of you who say that government uh, should be run like a business, this is business 101. The cost of services for open space is way less. What will we use the farm for? There'll be an open spaces, there'll be an open process with citizen participation to decide once we buy it. Five acres or so will remain open wetland and wildlife habitat. Another third, a third or so of the flat farm field is ideal for the playing fields that we probably need and we'll have a study to show that. But the lot with the farmhouse, the lot with the barn, and the other agricultural outbuildings and adjacent farmland, 10 acres or so, this is my part here. This is me. Yeah, this so is wrap me. it up because you're five minutes. I'm sorry. Up, so oh, no, my, don't wrap oh, I'm up. sorry. Yep, that's yeah, okay. I, you have 20 I, right, seconds sorry. or so. Um, anyway, could support one of those bright young farmers looking for a farm, part of the renaissance of small farms producing local food, but wildlife habitat, playing fields, local farm. None of these are possible <laughs> if we don't vote yes on question three. All right. Don't Thanks so much, Jim. Appreciate it. <laughs> he did. He did. He did well. <laughs> Thank you. Come on up, Tom. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. No offense, Jim, but I say vote no. <laughs> and I have a couple reasons why that I'd like to share. Um, Amy was kind enough to get the explanatory text out. Thank you. Uh, I jokingly told her that I gave her a B on content. Um, you know, they have in the Hartford Current how they rate the, uh, all the ads for our governor to be. So I'm going to rate this one mostly accurate. Happy uh, to get a passing grade. Passing grade, <laughs> yes. Um, I think there could have been a few more things added to that, and I understand there's 
a lot of legality about what you can say and not say. So I appreciate that. I think the question itself is flawed because it's asking for approval of a $2.47 million bond when the real number is at least 3.37 uh, when you incorporate the interest on the bond, which was uh, laid out in the explanation text. Um, I have a couple other items that I'll try to get through quickly. The town currently owns 644 acres of open space consisting of parks, schools, grounds, and recreational fields and facilities. I question whether we need more. Physical Services currently maintains 540 acres of grass at a substantial cost in labor and equipment to the town's taxpayers. I question if we need more. <clears throat> Weathersfield advertises 37 athletic fields including a multi-million dollar football stadium. Yet town staff claims that we are, quote, in desperate need of fields. When questioned about the type, location, and number of fields that could be placed in the Keisha property, we were told that the land would be used as open space until such time as a plan was developed. The town has no plan on how the land would be used. We were told it's been on the radar for numerous years, just waiting for the property to become available, yet nobody took any time to figure out what we could do with the land prior to this time. If the town purchases the land under the current bond referendum question, it will be legally bound to use the land only for recreational, open space, and other municipal purposes. The town would be prohibited from selling any portion of the land for, that has no use to the town. The existing farmhouse could not be sold, nor could potential frontage building lots along Highland Street and Collier Road. <clears throat> the town has not included any development costs that will be incurred by taxpayers to make the land usable. There are no costs included to raise the barn and outbuildings that will become a liability to the town once we take ownership. Costs to transform the property into athletic fields, parking spaces, possibly another school, will likely require another multi-million dollar bonding referendum. <clears throat> the town had, has, in, has been in private negotiations with the sellers and reached an agreement to purchase the, purchase the land at $2.4 million or $75 per acre. No third party appraisals have been presented to the public to justify this high cost. Large portions of the land are unusable due to topography, utility easements, and wetlands. Some of the property is classified on the tax assessor's cards as swamp. Our own tax assessor office has valued the land at $885,000, or $27,000 per acre. Earlier this year, the town of Windsor, just 10 miles away, purchased a former golf course with a clubhouse, which I consider much improved land in comparison to the Keisha property. And it consists of 95 acres with two po at $2.1 million, or $22 per acre. Weathersfield has offered three and a half times that amount for undeveloped land without justification to the taxpayers. By acquiring this property, the town will be reducing the grand list rather than allowing the buildable portions of these parcels to be developed into revenue producing property, thereby increasing the grand list. <clears throat> we are at a point in time where the town needs to be focused on reducing costs and increasing revenue streams rather than increasing spending and borrowing. Regardless of who gets elected to, the, to govern the state of Connecticut, I believe we're headed for some rough times, and any increase in financial, from this financial support to our town from the state government is highly unlikely. Okay, wrap it up, Tom. I'll conclude on uh, next time around. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. Mr. Colantonio?
Good evening. Gascol Antonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. First of all, I agree with you, Tam. Uh, I think there is enough space, open space in, uh, in Wethersfield. We don't really need any more. And by buying this piece of property, I think we're removing out of the tax roll about three quarters of a million dollars a year when it's all developed. You know, maybe 50, 75 houses, $10,000 each. It's a lot of money. Why do we need any more open space? I don't know. But anyway, I'm going to vote no for that. Uh, on a brighter account, I guess, or a notice, I would like to say thank you to Mike uh, Rell and also Ken Lesser. Uh, two weeks ago, they, they did come on my street. I didn't even know. I saw Mike Rell in a at the station, like, you know, the yard, and, and we talked, and, and he came. We went up and down, and, and, and I expressed my frustration. Now he, he agreed with me. He says, Gus, you're right. He left, and a few minutes later, Ken showed up. <laughs> what a nice surprise, you know? We did the same thing. For me, it was easy, because I already told Mr. Rell everything, you know, but uh, Ken also agreed. And he says, that, you know, they were going to talk with... Uh, the acting town manager. I don't know if that's been done or not, but they promised me that they're going to do something. I don't know what it is, but, you know, so I waited for 10 years. I can wait a little bit more. So <laughs> thank you again for coming. Take care. <laughs> Thanks, Gus. Mr. Young? Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. The little presentation tonight with the Weathersfield Historic Society um, is getting old. A, 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 what do you call it? A, a rope of onions and a loss of 40 some thousand dollars to the town of Weathersfield. Money that they walk away with for a mere hundred dollars a year for the Standish House as well as $100 a year for the Kinney Center, of which they carry on business and make money hand over fist, yet the, re the revenues we should have been getting. I guess we have no one to thank but those prior town council members, like Mr. Forrest, who supported and voted for that deal that's, that's terrible to our well-being here in town. It's terrible how you have given away all that money, Mr. Mr. Forrest. And then you think you're, you should be respected. No respect is coming from, you shouldn't be coming to you at all for what you've done. You and your compadres. Anyway, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the Keisha farm. And, and Tom and I have have, have, have a number of uh, things that he's come up with that I've come up with as well. Um, I'll, you know, the fact is, the night of the presentation, I didn't hear anything about comparable properties. When you go out and buy property, you shop the market. You shop around and find out what other properties are selling for. And in the case of a municipality, you should have had an appraiser something that nobody mentioned about an appraiser. And the appraiser should have been with you up front, up front of the negotiations. That means before you went to negotiations, you should have had the appraisal done. You walk in there without an appraisal, you're, you're like a, you're going to have your head taken off. And that's what's happening now. Two point, what, four million dollars? for a measly 32 acres of land. Five acres are wetlands. As Tom mentioned, and I mentioned, a month ago, when this came out, uh, about the property up in Windsor. I went up there and I, I walked around that property. Um, big piece of property for $2.1 million. And yes, the clubhouse is a nice brick clubhouse. It needs work. They're talking about maybe tearing it down because they really want it for open space. But who knows what will happen. 
But we don't have any improvements to speak of at the Keisha farm. I mean, even up in Windsor, they had put asphalt walkways for the, for the golfers down through the fields and all around, which apply to the issue of making it into open space where people can walk on those walkways, where the grass can be cut or not be cut. Let it grow up. But the fact is, it isn't anything. It's, it's so much more superior, that piece of property, than the Keisha farm will ever be. And it was priced at, sold at $2.1 million. And you people signed up on it. That is sickening. Now, at that meeting last month or last week, whatever, whatever that last uh, meeting was that you held, you should have shown us a lot of comparables. Not only comparables, but what, what else could be done with the property? How many building lots could go on? How, and, and convince the citizens of how, you know, they call it saleability. I guess politicians don't have to sell anything. They just push it right through. A normal person would have to sell it on whoever they want them to, whoever they need to. You folks don't. You just push it through and you hope it passes. But the fact is, you've given us nothing. And you should have. And, and as you said, you've been negotiating with them for months. It wasn't like it just came up out of the clear blue and, and you were totally unaware. Your people, whoever they are, um, the different committees you have, they've talked about that property being a property that should be acquired. There should have been a lot of information already sitting on the side as far as what it was worth. Your people failed. And you failed. You failed by paying three, to, agreeing to three times more than what the property is even worth. Okay, if you'll finish and you have a lot of, your five minutes are up, so just My five minutes up, are up. Well, um, I guess town is one poor steward also of property. Look how badly you let property run downhill and then you have to do referendums to fix it up. Look what happens when you are poor managers of, of a stadium over here at the high school where you collected no money over the course of 14 years to pay for the turf as it came up again. You are absolutely poor stewards in all different ways. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Come on up. Mr. Rue. Good evening. Good evening, George A. Rue, 956 Cloverdale Circle. I only came tonight to let everybody know I'm still alive. Okay? Glad to hear it. And uh, so, but since I was here, there's a couple of things I wanted to just share with you. Uh, I'll start off with my favorite complaint is speak up. I tried to watch the council at home, and it's terrible. A terrible, terrible, terrible. Speak up. You spend a lot of money in a lot of areas. Get some kind of high tech. We, we, I'm going to interrupt your five minutes for a second. Yeah, we, stop the five minute clock, which is another one of my comments. I know, we're going to add, we'll keep, we'll let it run. Um, we did have somebody come in to council chambers and adjust the microphones. And I had heard feedback from people that the volume has improved. So did you listen to the last meeting or two? Because No, no, I, I tell my... you, I was pretty busy. I got this little okay, friend of mine who keeps I me know. going. <laughs> but um, I did hear that from I, the public I'll try it again. I'll try it again. But I'm, I'm going by what even tonight. It's, it's difficult to hear. But then okay. again, you get all your hearing is not so good anymore. All right, continue on. Anyway, so that, and you mentioned the five-minute rule. My humble opinion is, your five-minute rule was not in force for a long time. I think it is unwise, under the circumstances that this country is in right now, to try to shut the citizenry down. It's just not smart. Enough said? Thank you. Uh, another quickie, uh, is, it, it pertains to the, uh, <clears throat> the maintenance of Cloverdale Pond. And we still get good reviews on it. I see kids over there. I see kids looking for frogs and people walking around. And there's a sign that says, don't feed the ducks and don't feed the geese and so forth and so on. You might want to add a little sign to that about the pooper scooper law, you know, because 
Uh, I've got a lot of I've got, I've got a lot of uh, New York Times bags at home, which I hand out to people when I see them walking around. But that might be a simple thing. The uh, the, the the other thing that I think is I was I was not here for the public hearing on the Kisha Farm, but I spoke to the issue prior to that, if you recall, and I was not opposed and I am not opposed to the concept of acquiring that property. I think Tom and, and, and Bob, they did an excellent job on collecting their facts, uh, at what, what, you know, the facts as they see them, and we see things from a very different perspective. I see the advantages to that piece of property to, to enhance the future life capabilities or the future desirability of a town like Wethersfield vis-a-vis -vis just being, uh, being developed into some mass you know, city like it. It just doesn't strike me. And, and I happen to be a firm believer that notwithstanding that there are large quarters of our country who think that climate change is a fake news thing, I don't think it is. And I think, frankly, if we can make a small contribution in this regard, I think that would be desirable and I think would be beneficial to some of the future generations of Wethersfield. And if any, the taxes are high, my taxes are going up, everybody's are gonna go up. But as I've said previously, that's the least of my worries currently. And my, and my age makes that easier for, me to, <laughs> easier for me to say. The caution that I would add, and I think, did Jim leave? Oh no, yeah, I guess he left. He talked about the, the desirability of what you're gonna do with it. And I heard ball fields where they're gonna have studies to prove that it's necessary or that it's not necessary. And my caution is do not accept these bland excuses and reasons why we need more ball fields or we need more lights because a lot of people tell me this and a lot of people tell me that Make damn sure that you use a little bit of engineering thinking and ask the hard questions is, what do the facts say? Do we really need it? And as open space, I think it's desirable. If everybody's going to want to come in and put more lights and more turf and more grass and a football field, I'm not too sure that's the wisest use of that investment. Time will tell whether you've been wise or whether you've been unwise. I'm banking for the moment that you will be smart and we'll end up being wise and being... Uh, respected for the decision that not you are making, but that the citizens are going to make. In the final analysis, they will decide. But if it is a plus, keep in mind, keep in mind that don't let any of your staff people, anybody, come with to you with a lot of bland, I got to watch my language, bland uh, excuses and reasons as to why we need this stuff. Because most of the time, and more often than not, we really don't. One last question on Cloverdale Pond. The good part is conveyed to the, to the maintenance department that there's a lot of stuff on the north side of the pond that's starting to encroach into the pond. And it's really the beginnings of a swamp. The grass is maintained well. The property looks good. There are a couple of trees that need some trimming. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the stuff that is growing at the water's edge ultimately will we'll start to uh, debase the good job that was done by the town in fixing up my pond. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, Come on up. Uh, good evening, David Kirk, 149 Broad Street. Um, yes, I, I want to make a comment about that Kaisha Farm as well. I did talk about it last meeting, and I, to be honest, I don't know enough about it, uh, about the implications or the, of, uh, I, all I know is one alternative would be, the two alternatives, is, well, three, the open space, which I think is a horrible idea. We got all this open space from the last farms, I don't know, 90-something acres or 80-something acres, and now we can't use that land ever. Uh, so we don't need to throw away land anymore. Uh, as far as, uh, it would be great to have it on the, the tax rolls that we could get, earn, get taxes for our town, because if we turn it into fields, it's going to cost the taxpayers more to, to keep it up. But um, 
I was thinking about the, uh, I was trying to compare it to something. I compare, I, first of all, I think, I, I was wondering why you're offering more money than, than uh, comparable size uh, lots in other uh, neighboring towns. And I thought, well, maybe we really, you really want the land. Maybe we really need, I, I heard we could use more fields. So, and, and I was thinking uh, the Dunkin' Donuts Park, it's, it's something to compare it to. When, when they, uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, Stadium, uh, field or whatever uh they they uh a lot of people were against it they thought it was a waste of money and and uh and it, no one's going to go into harford it's it's going to be a just a just wasteful spending but now that they harford has it some people are still unhappy about it but it's selling out and, it, and it's a, a great addition to harford you know before when you have it it's a different story and i think about the same thing if i moved to weathersfield and there was and that Kaisha farm was already fields I would love it because I have two kids, and they can go play soccer. They play soccer and travel, and, and and different teams, parks and rec, and they can go to Mill Woods or to the back, behind the schools. But you know they're limited. But if we had this more this other area with nice fields, I'm I'm sure I would love it. You know I wouldn't complain about paying a little bit, a few dollars more in taxes every year because it, it it would be beautiful. I'm sure, but. Uh, it wouldn't bring any money, and I know Weathersfield is out of balance as far as the ratio. Well, well, I guess if we build, build more homes, it'd still be out of balance. There's not enough commercial. I guess I don't know if you could turn it into a commercial area. It's a residential area, but um, but I'm I'm um, torn be, uh, in my opinion about what what we should do with it. I I probably would be wouldn't mind having fields. But I, I don't think it should be open space. I, I just think that's better. Last comment, uh, I've been go, driving around towns. I don't see too many political signs except for mine. I put one political sign, uh, Mike Hurley, out there. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, helping his campaign out too much. Maybe I am by, by having my sign out there. But, um, but uh, I, I wish him best of luck. You know, he asked me to put it up. That's why I put it up there. You know, you know he, he knows my history with, with him. But, uh, but thanks a lot. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Come on up, Mike. My name is Michael Monroe. I live at 7 Howard Avenue in Weathersfield, and I did not plan to speak tonight. Talk into the microphone. I did not plan to speak Perfect. tonight, but and I'm a little nervous, so please bear with me. But no uh, me and my wife just moved here a year and a half ago from Newington, and we love it in, uh, in old Weathersfield. Um, we love the historical nature of it. I give tours down at the Cove Warehouse pretty much every weekend. And um, it's been voted one of the most walkable main streets in all of Weathersfield. We have tourists. I have tourists from everywhere who come down just to enjoy our historical building. So as far as tax revenue, they come in. They go to Lucky Lou's. They go to the, all the shops there. So they provide revenue for our local businesses. And um, also, I just want to thank you all for your partnership with the Historical Society. Matthew, I mean, I don't like when people start saying disgrace and ashamed and things like that with, with discourse. I've met Mary, I've met Ken, I've met all of you. You've treated me nothing with respect. Michael on the, um, on the uh, Historical Society's board as a liaison. So I just want to thank you for your service. Thank you for what you do. Um, I know you hear a lot of negative things, but I just want to say one positive thing. Like I say, I had no prepared, I didn't plan to come up here, but I just want to thank you guys. And I'm very proud to be living in Wethersfield. Thanks so much. Anybody else like to speak tonight? Anybody else? Okay, seeing no other hands up, we will move into, um, there are no hearings. We have uh, reports from boards and commissions. We don't have any of them. Any counselors? Okay. You can't hear me. Uh, okay, we're going to work on it. Um, <laughs> I, I know, and I'm, I'm usually the, pretty good about it. Okay, so are there any council members that have reports tonight? Councilor Forrest. Just a quick one. Uh, insurance committee met and wanted to just note to the council that over the last two years, we have seen an increase in claims. There's been a couple more. Uh, significant claims, uh, one or two individual or individual claims that have run over the last two years. The general thinking, uh, Chris Monroe does an excellent job sort of keeping our rates uh, at a good spot and then understanding various stop-loss measures and the amount of, uh, that we do spend in insurance. 
but uh, it looks like uh, the, the last two years were possibly a bit of an anomaly, but they are have gone up. Uh, the amount of claims has gone up in the last two, which has, you know, put a little bit of pressure on our particular budget. But we're monitoring uh, this particular fiscal year, and um, it appears that we are back on track with the old trend line. Uh, but with that, we'll be watching it uh, closely and want to just let you guys know that there was a little bit of an uptick over the last two years, and the last year was um, a significant increase. Okay, good Good to know. Any other um, comment, re uh, council reports? Okay, seeing none, we'll move into discussion items. The first item is streetlight project. Kathy, do you have an update on, on these um, two items, streetlight and grant funded projects? Yes. Okay, excuse me. Yes, I'd like to um, present just some information on our streetlight project. We're currently getting ready to do the uh, installation of the different fixtures for the streetlights themselves. Currently, all the material's been ordered and is uh, partially on the way, and um, some of it's already in. We're actually going to use the Willard Pool parking lot as a staging area for the company doing the actual work. They're going to be bringing in some of the storage containers and um, putting them down on that site and using that for their materials. So they'll be um, taking their materials out of there, going out on the different streets and replacing the fixtures. And we're replacing all the street fixtures and also on all the town buildings. So it's a combination of all the overhead street lights and also the outdoor lighting at uh, the town buildings. So that's all in the works. They anticipate starting no later than the end of this month They'll get all the work going. Um, should take about, oh, we're looking at probably end of October, November, December, maybe a little bit into January, but they're gonna work through and just get it all done. So that's, um, that's the key point. So you'll start seeing their trucks around town starting to put all the lights up. Great, thank you. Are there any questions? What is, Kathy, what's the name of the company so if people see a truck, they're not put off? Sure, it's Higgins Company. It's Higgins. Is good. They're both They're hired by our consultant that's Power Secure, so they're going to be putting up all the lights. They're also hired as the town's maintenance to service the lights, so those are the trucks they'll see. At what point should citizens, if they see a light out, call us versus Eversource? Because I know that's the switch over, right? That's actually switched over. And people, residents can go uh, online to the town website and actually do an online report of a streetlight outage. And if definitely give the address of the, clo the closest address to the, tel to I call it the telephone pole, but yeah. I'm learning it's the uh, light pole but the closest address to the poll. And if you happen to get the poll number, that's a big help because that gets them right to the right, to the right poll. So right on our town website? Right on our town website, there's a, there's a link that you can go right to the, um, to uh, fill out a very, very quick form to get your um, information in. Okay. And if they have a problem with that, they can call the town hall. Is there a way that we can, I don't know if any stories have been written or any way of communicating that to folks, but that would probably be something important because they probably just assume it's ever source. Sure, we can get that out as a news release. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So the next item is the grant funded projects. And I'm just going to run down that list. Okay. We have, um, as many of you are aware, we've been kind of talking about the different, over the year, the town uh, staff have applied for a variety of grants for uh, different operations or projects that we want to do. And um, we've um, received a couple, so I'll, I'll address them. We're going to uh, be, we're funded to do a major reconstruction of Wilkett Hill Road that will be from Jordan Lane to Victoria Lane in Hartford. This is through a CROG regional street grant that, um, that we were awarded that now will go through a DOT process for making sure everything's in place 
will then receive an award letter from DOT and then we'll be able to move forward with that project. And that's actually to do a major reconstruction of the road, again, from Jordan Lane, kind of where they just did all the new paving now, right on into Hartford. And it's looked at as a regional project because it's going right into Hartford, onto Franklin Avenue, and will end at Victoria Lane. Okay. Are there any questions? Councilor Forrest. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, this is uh, to you, Madam Town Manager. I, I guess uh, this might apply to a bunch of these projects, but I was having a lot of discussions with the current projects that are going on, and uh, I was having discussions with residents down the, in Old Weathersfield where obviously uh, Garden Street has been sort of torn up and a new water main, I think, has been put in and so forth. And that one took a while. And I think that the residents are thinking, you know, when is this going to end? And it's not that I think the residents are thinking like, hey, it's great, I'm getting a new place, but they don't really have a feeling of like a, just some basic knowledge, like we're going to do mill and then we're going to wait two months and then we're going to pave it or whatever is going on here. And so I was just wondering on this project, is it possible to sort of get the word out for a feeling of what can the residents expect as far as sort of maybe they know they're getting a new road, but an inconvenience. This looks like a major reconstruction. If my understanding is that means you go past into the substrate that could take a while. Is it springtime? Is it fall? Is it a one-year reconstruction project, a six-month reconstruction project? Um, so I think that just some knowledge about sort of what that timing is supposed to look like might be helpful for the residents so they can just sort of, maybe it saves you a whole bunch of calls six months from now because they do have sort of the knowledge base. Oh, yeah, you know, it's going to be another three months because the town told us. So that's just some food for thought as you sort of move forward with some of these larger construction projects, especially a reconstruction, which I think takes a little bit longer. Sure, we can look at that. Do we have an anticipated start date? We're um, figuring that we'll be hearing, going through a review process and probably the spring get the award letter. And from that point, then we'd move forward. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions about this project? Okay. A smaller project, another street project through Crag is um, a mill and overlay of Highland Avenue from Thornbush to the Rocky Hill Line. This is a, a much smaller project. It's just a mill and overlay, but it's, um, I should have said both of these projects have been on the town's list for a long time, and it's nice to be able to see that we're getting uh, grants to come in to help us actually do these projects. This, this one is um, one that we hear about a lot with residents. So I'm happy to see that this portion of Highland Street um, is on a short list to receive funding. And do you have a timeline for this project? This will move a little quicker because, again, we'll wait to, we anticipate, again, this uh, spring award letter will come out and we can do that design in-house and it will be a much quicker process. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I just have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. That's, that was the question. No, I'm just kidding. Can yeah. Now, um, on Highland Street, Kathy, it goes behind, it sort of veers off and goes behind and all the way to Griswold. Um, that, not, that, that's not the portion, right? Um, it's, Highland goes past Keisha Farm, that part of, that's Highland. But you're talking about just the Highland from where it meets Thornbush. So it's just that straight shot. I'm just curious if that's what it includes. That, that is what the, what the grant funds are for. Our engineering, engineering department is going to be looking at that as possibly carrying Highland around the corner where it isn't done with um, current funds. Okay. So that they're going to look to see if they can't complete it all at the same time. Okay. Two different funding sources, but makes a lot of sense to do it all at once. Yep. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Kinds of things. I know you're on the hot seat tonight. <laughs> um, the town also re has received a what's called a uh, community connectivity grant, and what that grant is for is is to look at your roads and intersections to determine to make them safer and give them improvements for pedestrians and bicyclists. So you're looking at walkers, people that are biking and just making the um, 
the intersections and, and some of the roads safer from a, a, a standpoint of walkability and bikeability. And um, this was a grant that was applied for probably about a year ago now that we just found out about where we looked at um, the town's current, they, the town has a current um, bike path in town and we looked at that and as it went through Old Weathersfield and into um, some of the intersections right around the schools that are down in that area and the playground that's down there and looking at a lot of different intersections to kind of um, improve them. So um, ten, 11 different areas were looked at. So this isn't just a, we're going to go in and do one road or anything. Staff had looked at all the different intersections and ways to improve them both with um, crosswalks, with looking at the intersections, do they need to be tightened up, are they uh, not narrow enough, or things of that nature, and looking at the roads. If you think of Main Street, Main Street is very wide, and is there a way to put a bike lane on it? So a lot of these things were put in as part of the grant application. We have a plan for that, and as we begin to move forward with that, we're also going to present these plans and get public input so that we get a lot of feedback from the community because we've um, recently had a, a very um, active group start up in town, uh, a bike and walkability kind of group, and um, they were the impetus in us to begin with to get this application in very quickly under a deadline. So we got it in, we got the funding, we identified the intersections in the different parts, and now we're going to talk to the community, discuss that, and then move forward with it. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Any comments or questions? I just have a comment. There's an, a workshop on October 30th for the Bike uh, Pedestrian Committee, um, and it's an opportunity to go to different stations, learn more about sort of the idea of what we're trying to do with the connectivity for bike bicyclists and pedestrians within the town. And it's kind of it's going to be really a, a great event. It's at the community center, October thirtieth, um, and we'll make sure that there's more information about it. I can't remember. I think it starts at about six thirty, but you can find out what the what the ideas are. You can offer your own ideas. You can, we're going to kind of survey and see what people, uh, where people live, put it on a map, see what kind of problems that they know of in their neighborhood with regard to um, bike and pedestrian uh, uh, people who run into problems. Um, so so it's going to be a good event, so I just wanted to make sure we pitch it. And we'll probably be talking about Main Street as well. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. And next up, we were pleasantly surprised to receive funding for one of our, um, our Bell Pond Dam um, and Murphy Pond, Pond Dam projects. Um, through the State Bond Commission, if, if I can recall, I think this has been on our, our list for the town for over 10 years, and I would refer to Councilor Martino, maybe it goes... More than 15 years. Okay. <laughs> so um, it goes back a, a definite long ways. We've been trying to fund it with the state, and um, what it is is the town has a variety of dams in town, and Bell Pond Dam has been identified through a study as um, the one in the poorest condition and with the potential for uh, structural failure at some point in time. So that's why we've been working really hard and everyone has to get us this funding to basically rebuild the dam itself and then to dredge the area. So because it's been so long when we originally submitted it, it was fo both for Bell Pond Dam and Murphy Pond Dam, but 15 years later, we can do one project. And um, staff will be looking at that and looking at how those costs play out and see what else might be available. But we're going to concentrate on that because that's the one uh, that the, um, when we did our dam studies throughout the town, that's the one that came up with the worst condition. And that's the one that we had identified 15 years ago. So it hasn't gotten any better since then. And the uh, the recent studies have shown that it is getting worse and could be at a potential for failure in the future. Thank you. Any comments or questions? 
That's all, Latina. I just want to say thank you for them finally releasing the money. I know that Donna Hemmen was always an advocate for these, so shout out, Donna. You finally got it done. <laughs> Jody, when I got the call on it, I immediately called Donna to make her aware of it, and I said, sit down before I give you this information. <laughs> been a long time coming glad we glad we received some funding um, okay it looks like under um, unless are there any other questions or comments okay so it looks like when we move into council action we don't have anything to um, refer to the regular business agenda we don't have any ordinances or resolutions for introduction so we're going to move back into um, the public comment portion of our meeting is there anybody from the public who'd like to speak this evening? Come on up, Tom. Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. I just wanted to finish up where I left off. Um, the explanatory text attempts to minimize the cost impact to the average taxpayer. I'm not really sure what average, what defines the average taxpayer. I look around this room, I don't see any average taxpayers in the room, according to the valuations on all of our properties. Uh, the letter states that a residential property with an assessed value of $167,000, which under my calculations equates to a tax bill of $6,800, uh, will pay an additional $15.88 a year should the purchase be approved. Um, $16 a year doesn't seem like that much. You know, you could divide it up by the month, you know, $1.30 something a month, and that's hardly anything and so much a day and that's even almost meaningless but if you're on a fixed income and you're barely making ends meet it's a big deal and the sixteen dollars is really just the starting point we all know that something's going to be done with the land should the town decide to acquire it and it's going to cost more and more um, it's going to cost more to plan what you want to do with it. It's going to cost more to implement all those plans. Uh, you could be talking millions of dollars over the long run. And that's all an impact on all of us. And even more so to those people that uh, are barely uh, getting by. Um, another item that really I don't think has been mentioned. Has anybody considered the impact to the commercial property owners and to the businesses in town. They all pay property tax. I looked at the top 10 payers on the grand list, and some of them are over $19 million a year uh, assess assessment. So they're not going to be paying $16. They're going to be paying a couple thousand dollars. And to what benefit is that going to be to somebody that owns a, the Wethersfield Shopping Center. I mean, I think all these little things add up and tend to drive businesses away from town rather than bring them in. Um, I recently had a conversation with a very close friend of mine, and we were discussing the merits of the development at Fun Zone. Uh, this individual is, a, in my opinion, a highly respected land use attorney, and he said to me, quote, a town needs to continually develop and redevelop its land or the town will just wither and die. And I'll kind of leave it at that. But Weathersfield was created to be a bedroom community. Not a lot of thought went into the industrial base or the commercial base. We are extremely limited in the land that we can develop. Uh, I know we're making some attempts at trying to develop some of the properties that have been sitting idle for years, and that's great. But I think you really have to take a hard look at what could possibly done, be done with that land that would be more benefit 
to more of the people in town. And I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. I think one of the main flaws with the whole proposal is that we restricted the use of the land whereby we could not sell it. I, I could envision one of the speakers uh, at the public hearing, Phil Pasternak, he made an excellent point. He said that why not develop the frontage land on Collier and, and Highland Street? Those services already exist. There's already a road. Uh, there's utilities. The town already plows those roads. The town already sucks up all the leaves on those roads. There would be little additional cost to the town by selling off some of those parcels as building lots, and we could get some revenue from that. We could increase our tax base. At the same time, we could use some of the land that is highly suited for fields, some of the, some of the fields that are level or fairly level, and we could develop those into ball fields, and we could use the remaining space for open space, the swamps, the, the topography problems, the easements, that would all be open space. And that would be a win-win for everybody. And I'll, I just want to take one more minute that I'll take a liberty here, the microphones. You probably don't realize it, but the microphones are extremely directional. You have to be speaking straight into them. And it's human nature for each one of you to turn and look at the person next to you that you're talking to. So when Kathy turns to Amy to speak, we can't hear it. When Matthew turns towards the center, we can't hear it. It's a little better when it's from one far end to the other because the angle's not so direct. So and we are, we are, we are, we realize it, and we are working on it. Yeah, it's a I conscious. Thought it was better it's a last conscious time. thing. It's very hard to. Yeah. I do it. I'm talking to you, so yeah. I'm looking that yeah. way. So. Uh, yeah. I Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> 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 Can't hear you. Um, come on up, Gus. <clears throat> Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, you know, every time I come up here, it seems that I'm complaining. My sister-in-law lives on Bird Road, 23, 24 feet wide. I've been there like, you know, twice a week. And every time I go there, there are cars parked on both sides. When I go up the road from Silas Dean, it's basically hard for a passenger car to go by. And I always worry about safety. If there is a fire on one side or the other, and the fire trucks, they come from Silas Dean, they can even get, get through. Why? A few months ago or a few years ago, I questioned it about the speed limit. What's the, the guidelines for the speed limit? Or what's the guideline for parking now? Morrison Avenue, it's about 24 feet wide. And we can only park on one side. And that's good. At least if there is a fire truck going by, it can fit. Bird Road, you can park on both sides. Now... It's sad because every time I go by, and it's not just parking on the right or, you know, on one side or the other. Most of the cars or some of the cars or very often I find the cars, they're headed in the wrong direction or parking like, you know, on the left side when you're going to the right. And I always say, where the heck is the police? Why am I the only one that sees this? Or maybe they do. And they don't care. Or maybe they do. They, they call these people, but nothing ever gets done. I mean, really, where is, where is the enforcement unit in Wethersfield? This, this is crazy. Every time I get on the, on the road, you see a lot of people talking on the phone, doing this, doing that. Matter of fact, I went to the city yard today, and there was a, a bus, a school bus coming from wherever, I cannot, from the highway. And, you know, as they make the turn, and they had kids, they had kids, and, she, the driver was reading a, a pamphlet or a piece of paper while she was driving. This is school children. That's crazy. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Young? <laughs> 
Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. I want to continue on with where I, where I was. And one of the things that came to mind from what Mr. Rue said, he says, what do the facts say as far as the Keisha Farm goes? If what Mr. Rue said, what do the facts say? And I say, for 14 years, we have run a, 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 a recreation stadium, and after 14 years, there was no money. There was no direction on collecting money. There, was no, there wasn't anything that you could pull to help pay for the new turf. We had to go out and buy turf based on a bond. Or no, it was a lease, wasn't it? Yeah, one of the, one of the 11, 11 leases that Mr. Um, O'Neill spoke about. And you know, we could go right down the list of so many things that you folks have done wrong in this whole process. What do the facts say? And, and you can get clobbered. And you deserve to get clobbered. I'm, you know, Tom tonight brought up a, a, an interesting thing that I didn't think about either was the commercial property owners. How badly they're going to get hammered at that $16 that you said they're going to pay. Now, Tom is right. They're going to pay a heck of a lot more. And, um, and as we go along, we are going to continue to pay. You folks will have the open checkbook to do whatever you want once this deal goes through. You brought in a lousy, stinking deal, and if it passes, you will be allowed to, to continue to write more, uh, well, how is it, uh, more leases as we're going out. Mr. O'Neill said we have 11 of them right now. At the, and the cost of $1.1 million, and he said by next quarter it's going to be with some added things that you folks have done already, it's going to be 1.6. And what's going to happen in the year from now? It's going to be even more. And you know, I, I, I read the article, the article, the minutes that Mr. O'Neill talked about regarding how he, how he thought we, or I think the mayor mentioned how we got into this mess of financing. Blame another finance director when in fact it was the town council that did it. And what happens with those, what happens in the, as we go forward as interest rates start ticking up? And what happens with our leases? Our leases are, might be on fixed amounts, but as we continue, as you continue buying on lease, those interest rates are gonna be higher and higher. And there's gonna to get to a point where you're gonna say, we can't do this anymore. We've got to pay cash. It's the only way out. But you put yourself in a bind because you still have those payments to make every year, and you're going to have to pay cash to buy whatever in the world you might think you have to buy at that point, such as new, new police automobiles or a new dump truck or whatever it might be. There will be a collision at that point that will push our tax bill right up. And you'll all say, we had nothing to do with it, but unfortunately we're here and uh, we have to handle it and increase the tax. It was a, a move that should not have been made. Once you broke that, once you broke that, 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 that pace of buying and paying, buying and paying for it, once you broke that, you put yourself in one heck of a bind. And you really put us in a bind, and I resent that. Resent that, that we have such poor management here at this town. Because that's exactly what's going to happen. You watch, as those, those interest rates are going to go up, and there's going to be a point where you're going to have to buy, and you're going to have to continue making those payments. And we're going to be dead in the water. And you'll say, it was some other finance director who put us in this hole. No, you did. The town council did. And they should be taking the, taking the heat for it. No, you won't, because that's how you run your town. It's dishonest, and it's very poor how you run it. And the same thing with the Keisha farm. You should have had an appraisal done. You, sh you, had, you, you had a long time to do all of this, and you did nothing. You walk in there without even knowing what the property could be worth and make a deal. That's smart. But then again, that's Weathersfield town officials. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Young. And just to clarify, we had an appraisal done on the property. Does anybody else have any comment this evening? Your five minutes are up, sir. Does anybody else have a comment this evening? And not only should you have talked about it, you should have presented it. Anybody Can I get else? a copy of that appraisal? Okay. Motion to adjourn. Do we have so a, moved. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The motion passes. The meeting is adjourned. George, we'll meet with you whenever you want. You no, say, just say when you want to meet. Really? We did not have any in August, and we're trying to get back on track.